All right. Welcome to another episode of Talking Cloud. It's Friday afternoon. Hello. How are you? Yep. I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, good. It's long weekend edition. It is. Hey, Kevin. Oh, hey, Kevin. Um, yeah, long weekend edition. Like we were talking about before, I kind of forgot that this was a long weekend. So surprise long weekend uh, are always, surprise long weekends are always more fun than weekends that you've planned long weekend the best kind yeah the best kind and uh let's see i think last friday it was 14 degrees today it's zero it's a little cooler yep back to normal back to normal back to normal kevin uh how what what's the temperature where you are let's see uh let's see what uh kevin's dealing with right now it's like 25 degrees He's on vacation somewhere. Nice and warm. <laughs> All right, let's pull That'd up. Nice. Yeah, let's pull oh. up our presenter view here. And like I said to you, sort of as we got started, fingers crossed that I haven't. Oh, that's worse. Okay, Kevin, do you hear us now? Let's see. Let's make sure it's working. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I can hear you, can, you fine you as well. You can hear me. I think what it was. Um... Okay, oh, all good. good. Okay, all right. I was telling the the funniest jokes too, right there, like killing it, <laughs> and nobody heard. Um, okay, so what I was saying is, I last week we talked about the. CloudFormation, the new CloudFormation importer feature. So yeah. I said, I'm going to test this out and see how it works because we, we had a few questions and stuff. So this week I just created through ClickOps a really simple VPC, single region, multi AZ, mm -hmm. couple NAT gateways, blah, blah, blah. And then what you do is the first thing you do is you run a scan job. And uh, did you solve world hunger? Yeah, uh, I did. And you run a scan job, and even in our simple little demo account, it came back with close to 600 resources. Then okay. what you have to do is you you have to, if you know what you're looking for, you can search. So like okay. I searched for VPC, it showed me nothing. But if I searched for EC2, what it what it's doing, if I, if I, if I remember this correctly, what it's doing is when it's running the scan job, it's actually defining for each of the resources it finds which type of cloud formation resource it is so to okay. find my vpc i had to search for ec2 and then what is it ec2 uh, colon colon vpc yes um, yeah. but anyways there was a lot to look through so you go through and you select the resources that you want to include mm -hmm. uh, you can search for them you can flip through the pages and then you continue on and what it then does is it goes off and generates the template for you. Oh, one other thing that was really interesting. I'd, I'd clicked a couple things. And it's smart enough to figure out for you or try to figure out for you if you've missed any dependencies. So, uh, okay. like, I selected all the VPC components I could find, right? The subnets, the route tables, the subnet associations, uh, the flow log, the standard stuff that we would put in there. Yeah. And I missed the, 
it was something to do with flow log. I can't remember what it was, but after I said, okay, that's all the stuff I wanted, another screen popped up and said, hey, we think these resources are also important. So oh, that's good. Yeah, there was something about the flow log. There was a couple other things. So I said, yeah, I'll just select those. And then next, and I got a CloudFormation template. Couple things that I noticed. And, and mm. you and I talked about this last week. I'm, just, yeah. I'm assuming that this would be a, let's just How call it a, a non-trivial task yeah. to do this. Okay, so here's the things I noticed. No parameters. Okay. okay. Everything in the template is hard-coded. Gotcha. Um, I ran out of time. What I wanted to do was save the template and then pick the template up and just go to a different region and run it and see what would happen. Based on what I saw in there, I, I don't know if it would work or not. Like it, it was even grabbing um, like the EC2 instance that I had defined. It was grabbing yeah. the IP addresses. You know how you can like... You can basically oh, okay. say assign yeah. an IP or just use DHCP. It was grabbing, like, it was a configuration actual... snapshot. Wow. Okay. Okay. So. It's yeah. extremely granular down very to. Very granular. Yeah. Very granular. The bare bones uh, of what your environment is. Yeah. Okay. But I think it would do what you would want it to do, right? Like, if you had an yeah. environment and you wanted to get a CloudFormation template out of it or a CDK template. It's going to do that. And there yeah. was a little thing there that said something, and I'm paraphrasing along the lines of, you know, check this kind of thing. Like, be, <laughs> be careful with what you have here. Uh, and you yeah. might have to make some changes and stuff like that. But, hey, it did what it said it was going to do out of the box. It gave me a template. Uh, maybe later this afternoon or, or over the weekend, uh, I'll run the actual template just to see what happens, maybe dump it into a different account, dump it into a different region. But yeah, I'd be curious. I'd imagine the like, resource specific resources would fail, like AMIs, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, but you know what? If you even if you just want to migrate from something like Terraform to CloudFormation, this is a really quick way to do it. It's going to do it, right? Yeah. And then if if you if you wanted to, kind of what I was thinking is you could go through it. It, it would you'd still need to know about CloudFormation, like. Yeah. Like you couldn't edit that template without knowing something about CloudFormation, right? So you could go through the template, create the parameters that make sense for you, remove the attributes that you don't want hard coded the next time you yeah. run it kind of thing. But uh, if you were looking to take a snapshot of your environment and save that snapshot somewhere for safekeeping, it's going to replicate exactly what you had the moment you ran that import option. So I thought that was kind of I thought it was kind of slick. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna give this a try. Yeah. The other thing it reminded me of is, uh, you know, like if you're building like an API gateway, you can use yep. like a Swagger file. You could use what's it called? Oh, sure. Open Open API outputs yeah, as yeah. well. It almost kind of feels like that. Like you hmm. set your API gateway up, everything's the yep. way you want, and then you export the Swagger file. You you export the Open API file, and then right. you put that in your repo or something. Felt very yeah, similar to that. Okay, and then you have like a, a standard template for what your environment should look like. Yeah, if, if you ever, that's good. yeah, if you ever had a catastrophic failure, then in theory you could you run could that template yeah. and get it back, right? Um, I, you know, you mentioned AMIs, and I, I regret now not looking at the AMI mm -hmm. piece. I kind of just was yeah. whipping through the template really quickly. Um, I'll have to check and see what it did with those. Yeah, because that's a one gotcha that comes to mind right away is those are all regional, right? So yeah. So that kind of gets into other things. Like how would you, uh, I haven't read enough about it. Like what's what's the intent of this thing? Is it is it just to give you the template or is it to give you a template that you can use somewhere else? Because mm. using that template somewhere else is probably a, a, a tough challenge, right? Like to, it involves a bit more like work. Yeah, for sure. There's yeah, definitely some updates yeah. that will have to be made yeah. from the sounds of it. Yeah. Well, but yeah. it's good. Yeah, yeah, good. So that that's the the update. Um, and let's get into the couple articles that right. uh, we we came across this week. So here's the first one. Uh, I I stumbled across this early in the week. When's this from? February seventh. Wow, that's a long time ago. Uh, Amazon's cloud boss likens generative AI hype to the dot com bubble. Mm. This is an interesting article. So I'll include this in the newsletter because I, I definitely think it's it's worth a read. Um, but I, I kind of let me zoom in a bit here. There we go. It's a little better, right? Easier to read. Uh, so you can see here, 
essentially what they're saying, what he said is, uh, maybe gener maybe AI, the hype on AI is, um, uh, what's the, uh, wow. Let me, let me, let me say it this way. He's kind of basically saying the hype around the companies that are in the Gen AI space right now is probably overblown, okay. but the hype yep. about Gen AI in general is not overblown. And the analogy that he uses is kind of back, you know, in the early days of the internet. Was the internet overhyped? No. But were those original early businesses in the dot com? Like yeah. yeah. Were they overhyped? Absolutely. And and I can kind of see his point, right? And we were just talking about this on a call the other day. Like we were talking yeah. about the fact that well, what happens to all of these little Gen AI startups that are building all these great pieces of software? Right. Once, if you run your entire business on Office 365, you run your entire business on Google. The Google suite, yeah. Once they have tools, why would you, like, if it were like me, general... I'd be, yeah, I'd be more inclined just to use the tools that come with Office 365 or come with Google with your than somebody right? else. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it tears up a, a price point or whatever, but they'll, I'm sure you'll get access to, um, yeah, Chat GPT in the your Microsoft suite and uh, the Google the what is it the new Google I've immediately forgotten I don't know they but that'll be in there I too right like yeah every time I turn <laughs> it was Bard and now it's yeah Gemini or Duet? Gemini yeah that's it yeah it's every Gemini, time I yeah. I don't I don't. I don't get it. It like we'll talk about name changes in a second because it's one of the yep. news releases here that we have. But yeah, I can't quite figure that out. Like it's already very confusing and people are trying to figure it out and I can never remember what Google's calling what they have. It, it seems to change or maybe it's different solutions and it's just confusing to keep it all straight. I don't know. But yeah, like a lot of those narrower use cases will get eaten up by those big general models, right? Um, of course, you're still always going to be able to find some sort of niche um, data processing, data analysis kind of uh, areas where these smaller models will excel, right? Like you can train uh, to fit on whatever set of data you happen to need. Yeah. But for most people, for like the general generative AI tasks, I can't imagine you would want to go much further than ChatGPT or Gemini. Yeah. Like, so I, I guess we'll see. Yeah, I guess we'll see how it plays out, right? And, and especially to, to the earlier comment about if you if you're already paying for that service, yeah, it's Office three sixty five or something else, and they've got those tools built in. Sure, it's going to up your costs a little bit, but wouldn't most? I would, I would think most businesses would be more inclined to just say, "Well, I already have this. We could just extend the functionality and see if it fits our needs," right. rather than going out and trying to find individual point tools for specific things there's a lot of staying power there right it's very sticky yeah yeah so. i would i would think so um yeah so here that gets us to let's let's move around a little bit did you see this open ai's new sora offering i did see this and this is kind of insane uh kind of i think is maybe it's quite insane it. actually it's quite yeah. crazy yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was showing karen this last night and she's like, no, that's not, you can't write three sentences and have it generate. I was showing her the one where I think it's, um, they described it as people walking on a street in Japan, cherry yeah, the blossoms, cherry they're blossoms. walking through the, and she's like, no, that, and I'm like, look, <laughs> I, I realize this is marketing stuff, but this is supposedly what this does. Um, yeah. Like talk about, talk about the things that I, I think have a potential to, dramatically change everything the way you know what i i, I don't know what i'm trying scary to say good. but scary good it's yeah scary, scary good. good yeah yeah unbelievable um the, like uh, it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting year with the election coming up and everything right um yeah i looked very yeah. briefly at this because that was the very first thing karen said to me she's like well can't can't wouldn't this allow you to make videos about people like real people and stuff mm -hmm. i didn't like look at this so every video on this page was generated by the AI, right? Yeah. So this one was particularly striking to me of the woman walking through downtown, what appears to be downtown Tokyo in the in a rainy on in a rainy, rainy night. Rainy street. The reflections are just incredible. It's like, mind blowing. It has. It seems to know 
how the light is supposed to behave in the scene, which yeah. is just just blows my mind to see. And the sunglasses. There's a like, train look, one look after this the, too. Look at the quality, like the the detail in 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 her skin. Yeah, like it's lifelike. It's not yeah, just this shot... sort of what you see in a lot of video games where it's like everybody has that marble type skin and stuff. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah, this close up shot you would never know, right? No, the, no. Her, there's something weird going on with how she walks, but but you would never. You wouldn't be no. paying attention to that anyways. Well, okay. So that reminds me a little bit of the conversation we had yesterday about uh, when I was making those short videos and it has the, I, I won't mention any particular products, but it has the the AI tool to do eye tracking now. And oh, how yeah. I said, if you, if you when I tried it, if you sat and watched my eyes, it's yeah. weird, right? Yes. But if, if you were just listening to the video, I'm making eye contact with you now, even though I was reading a script that was just a little off center from the camera so yeah this is one of those one of those tools that automatically adjusts eye level to be at the camera at height. the camera height right so pretty yeah. neat but to your point like if you're just sitting watching this you're not going to yeah. probably notice those little odd things if you're just interested in watching the video right yeah pretty, like it's not incredible. it's not perfect yeah no. it's not perfect by any means but it's wow just wow. incredible yeah there's some pretty funny uh bloopers down on the page too but oh is there i was looking yeah. for this piece right here the safety piece mm. um oh yeah sort of to your comment about election year and sort of what karen said to me last night um i, I could only imagine what's happening behind the scenes to try to make sure that people don't misuse this thing um they're gonna have so many problems trying yeah. to lock this down oh yeah um yeah and it's gonna get used for some pretty nefarious things and i don't know yeah, yeah I, hopefully they can start they can lock it down enough because this is it's extremely powerful to just be able to generate video with a a paragraph and yeah, yeah where were, just where were the to, bloopers uh they should have been on that page on the capabilities page the capabilities page. oh there's one right here like he's walking on the treadmill the wrong way right oh okay yeah <laughs> this one here yeah yeah, yeah. There's a dog well, just walking on here, the windowsill. Yeah, here's the thing that I think about this stuff is this, I've got the treadmill one up right now. Uh, yep. You know, camera motion, the whole bit's happening here. Yeah. If you think, like, what's it going to look like in a year? What's it going to look like in six months, right? As as this continues to get better and better. This is going to let anyone make a movie. Yeah, if it's in your TV head show. and you can properly describe it. Uh, you yeah. can start making these scenes, right? Something else. It's just it's mind blowing, which kind of actually takes me back to to this first article here mm. about uh, the generative AI hype. Um, you know, I, I totally understand what they're saying here, but the other part of me was kind of like felt a little, and I, I don't know if I'm just misinterpreting this, but felt a mm. little sour grapey. You know a little I mean? salty from like, uh, like, <laughs> we're not the ones that thought of this so a lot of this stuff's overhyped not not the oh, okay. space in general but these other things are overhyped um right i don't know if i'm just being a little sour about well, it I, I don't know we'll see right like i mean i mean there's some tech there's a thing where for some use cases you get a little more leeway than others and film is one of those i think because you, you'll have this thing in a lot of older media like uh things filmed in the 80s 90s you'll have background actors that are doing something strange or but you don't notice it right it's not yeah. part of what you're paying attention to so in film you get a little more leeway in stuff like coding and uh where you need more precision that's going to be really tricky because yeah. you need to be exactly right to yeah. get the program to run so i, I don't know I Sorry, you were mentioning the the programming piece. I saw a thread yeah. on Twitter this morning. I should have I should have screen capped it, and we could have included it mm. here. And the, oh yeah, you never know, right? Like cause somebody could just be blowing smoke. But the person's yeah. like, oh, I have a buddy who's not a programmer, and they're building their uh, a complete accounting system or something just by prompting, <laughs> writing prompts. And it's I'm like, I bet your mileage Ooh. is not is going to vary there, right? Like, do you want to build those kinds of things with no programming knowledge? I, I don't know. I think I think that's probably for the for the likes more than anything, or the or the salty Hopefully commentary. Not, yeah. yeah. Hopefully you're not doing anything too exotic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all so that's Sora. Stuff, 
Yeah, that's Sora. Pretty cool. Uh, just because we're talking about about AI, Gen AI and stuff. This one also came out. This is Amazon Science uh, talking about a new uh, model or mm -hmm. model here. Yeah, Base TTS, which is uh, text-to-speech. It's speech library, yeah. If I remember the post I saw, uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't download the whole thing. And uh, I would assume that because this is on the Amazon Science page, to be honest, it's going to go like, way way over my head of understanding of how all this stuff works but um you know it says here that it trained on a hundred thousand hours of public domain speech data a billion parameter uh model i guess it's the the comment that i had seen somewhere was this is the largest text-to-speech model ever built uh, up wow. to this point um, I don't really know much more about it. Like I said, I, I didn't download the paper and read it just because I thought it would be significantly past my understanding of, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like reading the, the side effects of the, 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 the prescription that you're having to, I'm like, I don't know what this stuff is. So I just thought this was interesting because we've been talking a lot about gen AI and just the size of this model was seems pretty large. large. Yeah. yeah. Well, if it's anything, uh, I'm curious to see if it scales uh, in the text-to-speech space like it does in a language space uh, linearly with parameters and compute thrown at it. Because, you know, if you train, if you throw more power and more parameters at a large language model, it tends to just get better linearly. Mm. I'm curious if the same thing holds. I'm not but... sure if you're looking at the page or not, but the, the one mm -hmm. thing I'll, I'll put you on the spot, which I do every week, uh, hopefully you're getting used to it by now, but they, oh, they yeah. say here, uh, echoing the widely reported in quotes, emergent abilities of large mm. language models when trained on increasing volumes of data. Yeah. Can you tell me what, what do they mean when in quotes, they put emergent abilities? What does that mean? So, what they're talking about are abilities that they can't really trace back to any individual part of the system, but because of the way the system interacts and as it scales and gets larger and has more connections, these are properties that emerge. So that's what the emergent properties means. Okay. So they're not really, a, you can't really quantify them on like a node, like a micro level, but as the system scales, they get better or they appear. Okay. So, so one he... thing that... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, oh, go okay. ahead. I was just going to say, it seems like the more you feed these models, the better the view, worldview they have. Like they can, con I don't want to say conceive, but it's kind of what I'm thinking here. They can, they have a better worldview with more data, it seems like. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask a follow-up question and this might hmm. just be again... You know, I'm just kind of starting down these paths. You kind of know how, how I felt about this Gen AI stuff mm -hmm. for a long time. We've had lots of conversations. Yeah. I'm slowly getting converted here as we have more of these these <laughs> these weekly things. And yeah. it's more and more. Keeps Every time up. you turn around, it keeps coming up. So if if we go back to the Sora thing, right? Like, it doesn't matter which video yeah. we look at. So here's the, I'm looking at a Jeep driving here and it says the prompt is the camera follows behind a white vintage SUV with a black roof as it speeds yep. up a steep dirt, blah, 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 blah. Is this idea of emergent capabilities or abilities meaning like we don't quite understand how it took the prompt and, and like in the model decided to make this particular video, but it does it. Is that what that means? Or am I thinking about Correct. it the wrong way? Kind of. Yeah. So like, the ability to translate those tokens that you're passing through it, because you're not just passing individual words, it breaks those down into tokens and assigns, figures out the meaning, and then over the training period, figures out better and better ways to defuzz the noise that it's using to generate these images, right? These frames. Okay. Um, so again, it gets has a better picture of what you're asking for, basically, mm -hmm. and how the world should be working in, in these photos. Yeah. It, another, like a, a funny example from well, about a year ago, was uh, someone asked an AI to generate a video of Will Smith eating spaghetti. Oh, I saw I this. <laughs> I, saw, I saw it because it's horrifying. of all the... Yeah, it, 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 was, it was slightly <laughs> scary, right? And, it's nightmare and, fuel, right? Yeah, and, and the but... commenter was, was mentioning, like, look at what happened a year ago compared to... They were yeah. talking about the Sora stuff here, like just how far it's come in a year. So yeah, to your it's point, if, yeah. if you haven't seen the Will Smith eating spaghetti 
AI video, you should <laughs> definitely check it out. But uh, yeah, it's interesting, let's say, right? Yeah. So yeah. that it's it seems that with more resources, more parameters, you can and better training sets, you can kind of fine tune the model to behave in the way that you want, right? Which is yeah kind of what you'd expect from this kind yeah. of system. Okay, right? perfect. All right, so that is uh, base TTS. And since we're st still talking about Gen AI, I'm gonna flip over a couple <laughs> more uh, lines here, or a couple more tabs. Tell us about mm. this one. This is, I've got the Microsoft and oh, AI yeah. say they're watching bad actors. Tell, tell us a little bit about this one. So what was funny about I, what I thought was funny about this was how the bad actors are using these services. But to give you a little context, uh, Microsoft and OpenAI are blocking known bad actor, or if they detect bad actors on their platforms, they're blocking them from using ChatGPT to generate uh, text or code or whatever. Yeah. But they're using it just like you or I would. <laughs> they're yeah, writing I, email. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. As soon as you said that, I'm like, I hope that's where you're going because I've got the, I've got the, the, the the paragraph here, blah, 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 uh, are using tools to improve their productivity, streamlining yeah. and accelerating their work, but they have yet to unleash the technology's full potential. So just like all of us. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're writing emails or blog posts or whatever, right? <laughs> and doing yeah. some light coding, which is kind of funny, but yeah. it's it just goes to show that this technology is... Uh, it's available to everyone, right? Uh, yeah. So. You know what you know what worries me about this is, you know, mm. social media in general continues to get, I think, yeah. the, the 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 bad press that it rightly deserves. On we we can't manage these environments right now against things that I would say yeah. people shouldn't be doing, or or we decide as a society isn't appropriate. And now it seems like we're turning it up to eleven. Like if you can't do the social media platforms as it is right now, how do we expect these platforms to not end up in the same situation where they're just used for things that we deem inappropriate? Yeah, and uh, it was already impossible, essentially, to combat disinformation on these platforms, right? Yeah. Now Sora's out. Uh, good luck, I guess. Um, anything yeah. you see on the internet now is suspect, right? Yeah. If it wasn't already before. So you should have your your filters up for that yeah yeah i guess it's it's uh what's the saying trust but verify yeah right? like like you it's mostly you, just you, verify at this yeah point. <laughs> you re, yeah it's just verify you just really can't believe anything that you see anymore looking at these kinds yeah. of things yeah that's what it feels like yeah all right so that's enough gen ai talk Pfft, it's gonna go nowhere <laughs> all right so let's change gears and let's have a look at uh, i'm gonna do this one first um, let's have a look at some AWS updates from the week. Mm. This is my favorite update from the whole week. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, it's a good one. Yeah. It's, uh, these kind of things really bug me. I know they shouldn't, right? I got other things to worry about. It, 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 it harkens back to the time I, I worked for a very large company and mm. the, they would routinely change the names of the products and you, you talk to yeah. the customer, and they're like, oh, okay, well, what new features does it have? And you're like, well, nothing. Oh, okay, so, uh, <laughs> you know, how do I talk to it? Well, the same way you were talking to it before. And they're like, then why did you change the name? And you're like, well, I don't know. It kind of feels like that. <laughs> like, okay, we're not going to call it Kinesis Data Firehose anymore. We're just going to call it Amazon Data Firehose. Right. And, and you've seen here, yeah. no difference in APIs, basically no difference whatsoever. No changes, We're just going to change the name. It seems. Yeah. yeah. And I get it, right? Uh, I know there's there's whole teams of, of people that figure out how to brand these things and how to talk about them. And, and I'm sure it makes sense somewhere. But if I put my customer hat on, to me, in a platform that's as large as AWS and as mm. dynamic as AWS... If you change the name of something, it's just making it harder for people to understand what it is they're supposed to be using. You know what I mean? Right. That was so my it's, take on so, this. So what did they actually do? Do they move data streams into a nested kind of service like they did with some of the old uh, VPC it, access analyzer services? It's kind Things of like hard to tell because like data okay. firehose is just kinesis data firehose right it you can see they describe right. it the same way you can reduce the complexity of maintaining streaming data delivery pipelines that's what 
Kinesis Data Firehose did. Maybe they're just moving some of the pieces around. Like Kinesis is like when people think about Kinesis, like when I'm training, running training classes and stuff, people think about Kinesis as real time data processing. Firehose was never that. It was a near real time because it buffered up the changes and then batch processed right. or batch load them somewhere else. So maybe that's the thought process behind it. Like maybe they want to move it away from the brand of Kinesis because it's not real time. I don't know. Could be. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. I just find these kinds of things, like I said, on a big platform that changes so much, it just, it ends up confusing people. Like, well, yeah, well, what be... is this, right? It'll be confusing for the first little while. I think probably they probably what they found was they did some UI UX testing after some surveys of customers and people were like, Why is there a data stream and a fire hose? What's the difference? That kind of thing. So Yeah. yeah. Makes I'm sense. I'm sure we'll get Makes used sense. to it. Yeah. Oh yeah. This one. This is not But it is annoying. It is annoying, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm I'm traumatized from all the the times in the past where I had to keep explaining. No, that's the same as this. We just and, and so right. it just brought up those old feelings of dread where I was like, oh no, <laughs> please don't do a lot of this. I don't want to spend all my time just telling you it's the same service just with a new name. Um, so this is a good one. Control Tower introducing APIs to register organizational units. So now we can oh good uh, manage. Uh, control tower at the OU level versus just the individual account level. That's kind of what I took from this. And programmatically too. Programmatically. Yeah. 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 I wonder, um, yeah, like I wonder, you know how control tower has versions and you've got to update mm -hmm. your, what do they call it? You update your landing oh, zone? Oh, do you think you could write a script to run those updates? I don't know. Like I'm looking here at, uh, it looks like they've got sort of that, uh, a list of, of what of what they're supporting out of the gate with these new things, right? Mm. They also include CloudFormation support. So you can write this all in your your uh, favorite infrastructure as code templating tool, also known as CloudFormation. Um, I just, whenever I see this, I know increasingly we've got more and more customers that build on top of Control Tower. Like Control Tower, yep. for customers that are just getting started, seems to be the de facto sort of this is how you get started seems like the standard for setting up an org at the moment right yeah yeah now different situation if you've if you've gone out and built it without control tower uh how do you kind of retroactively put control tower in i think that's a whole different conversation but these always catch my yeah. eye just because of the amount of control tower work that seems to come along and, and how people are using it as a starting point so whenever you start introducing these additional features and stuff it always catches my attention that's good. I did see they integrate it with uh, Terraform too. So, yeah, they've, that's, I, uh, I, I forget what it's called. So you you can pick your tool of choice, which is always yeah. nice, right? Yeah, yeah, very good. So there's that one. Firehose. Since I've messed myself up now because I'm like I've been jumping between tabs. Uh, let's mm. go over here. We'll do one more AWS announcement. Guard duty. All right. Oh, this. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'll admit. I didn't realize with guard duty and the malware protection that if you, hmm. if you had, in, if I'm understanding this one correctly, if you had an EBS volume associated with an EC2 yeah. instance, and you wanted to enable malware protection. If it was using an, uh, an AWS managed encryption key, it wasn't supported. It was only supported if hmm. you had, and, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm reading this right because I just looked in the first thing here, right? It says, in addition to unencrypted EBS volumes and volumes encrypted with C, uh, CMKs, customer managed keys, you can now use scan EBS volumes that are encrypted with EBS managed keys. So I guess in the past, it didn't do that. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that, to be honest. I don't think, I think we've had a few customers sort of looking at this as a potentially potentially something Option. they wanted to turn on, but I don't think we actually have anybody running it, do we? Not that I know of, no. Yeah. But we have lots of people running guard duty, but not this protection yes. plan with it. Yeah. Specifically specifically for scanning your EC2 instances, which is also uh, relatively recent, I think, as an offering. But I think so, yeah. A couple of years yeah. anyways. Yeah. But yeah, no, this is good. Um, we should be able to scan everything. I, if it's uh, part of the service, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what this what this feature is worth. Like, you know, I know 
guard duty will give you a certain amount of usage every month for free and then you've got mm. a whole bunch of different protection plans you can add to it right like there's s3 right. there's eks there's this one there's maybe about six of them now um i just wonder sort of how like how does that affect the overall cost of your guard duty implementation but much like i mentioned on control tower for me and when we're building out systems for customers guard duty is like it's, it's default just, on it's yeah. yeah it's it's part of our deployment plan from the very beginning gets integrated into some sort of alerting system and it's yeah. there uh this is just a another way to add some some additional protection in your environment and give you some more insight into what's happening yeah, we have people using the container scanning, I'm pretty sure. Container scanning, lots of S3 protection. Um, yeah. Oh, what's the other one? Um, there's RDS in here now as well. And yeah. there's, I'm forget Lambda. Yes. Yeah, Lambda's there as well. So lots of, lots of good stuff there. And then I think we've got one tab to go. I think it's this tab. How oh, cheap boy. is AWS Graviton 2? Oh yeah, this, so I came across this when I was just looking for things for the show, and this caught my eye. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? What's the uh, the cost savings for, for uh, switching from eighty six to ARM on AWS? Uh, and do I select from twenty, forty, fifty, or sixty? <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's see. Uh, okay, in I'll US put, I'll, one. Uh, okay, I'll put my fanboy hat on and say it's sixty. Uh -huh. No, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but you could get up to 60% in uh, AP Asia Pacific South. So it's going to depend on the region that you're running Graviton processors right. in. So because of the costing differentials in, across, in EC2 across the regions, um, you get a, a variation in savings by switching to Graviton. And apparently it is 60%. I think if you scroll down a little uh, oh, there for we the go. right, right workloads. Savings by migrating to Graviton in each region. So most yeah, of our customers a... are running in CA Central 1 or U... yeah. look at CA. Oh, these are all roughly 20. So yeah, yeah US. still 20% savings for changing Over... the underlying architecture. If you can use an ARM chip, yeah. then you yeah. should. It's yeah. basically the lesson here. Yeah. Because you'll save 20 25% depending yeah. on where you are. Yeah. But you can run in Asia Pacific and... If you're not super dependent on looking for what you're doing, you might be able to save a little more. Save switch up, to up to fifty percent. Yeah. Now that, so, that is actually that that number is it's kind of compelling. Shocking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh man, is like you know we we've been talking a lot about how my brain's been reprogrammed with uh, yeah. different phrases because we've been uh, Karen and I've been binge watching Letterkenny. Whenever I oh, say yeah. shocking, I think of Elf. <laughs> Isn't, isn't it from Elf? Nice. It's like uh, something yes, about, yeah, yeah. It's shocking. I, I can't help myself. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, you know, the thing that, that always catches me with this is, and you said it, if you can run on an ARM processor. Right. That's, that's the gotcha. I think, the, the thing that people overlook. Like, you just look at this and go, you know, forget running in, in AP South East, South 1 mm -hmm. or South 2. But somebody turns around and goes, well, I could save 20% in the current region. Why am I not just running it arm processors right now right graviton processors well there's there's a bunch of other things involved here right can can you actually do what you want to do on those on those arm processors yeah, your, your workload may not support it yeah if you're on windows yeah. i know there's some windows arm yeah distributions i think but yeah. for the most part you can't yeah. um we've even run into this uh, a couple times in non-windows based environments with mm. uh particular libraries and stuff like that so right you know, it's, it's a yeah. linux operating system no problem but then we've got a dev trying to do something on top of it and a package yeah. that they need or a library that they need it, it's not supported so it's then you're like on arm. Yeah. yeah so there's a, there's some upfront work that you should be doing here before just saying we're going to use arm processors going forward but to your point if you can run an arm processor you're saving then, dollars right out of the gate without having to really do much other than your homework to make sure it's supported. Yeah, it just makes sense. And I mean, yeah. this is specifically for EC2. I don't think the cost savings are echoed across most other compute services, although I think Fargate might be the exception. But What about Lambda? Because I know what I do now for Lambda, yeah. but I'm more I'm thinking more about the sort of the benefits uh, of, of performance, right? So 
in, okay, in yeah. my brain, if I'm thinking, if I'm going to build out Lambda functions and what I'm doing is supported using a, an ARM-based processor like Graviton, my default now is just to, to use Graviton with Lambda. But I don't know, mm -hmm. like, are there, the cost savings are probably minimal versus the potential improvement in performance. I don't know. Right. I guess it depends, as always, it depends on your application, right? If you can support it and run it, but... Uh... Yeah, you'd have to get up to pretty high lambda usage for it yeah. to yeah to make any to... any real difference, right? But yeah. once you get to that point, yeah. it's worth considering. Yeah. yeah, and even if it's giving you a little bit of a performance boost, and you're not running those lambda functions like tens of millions of times a month, kind of thing, right? It's a yeah a, a s smaller environment. <laughs> Just getting the the slight performance boost forget the, the potential cost savings but you know I, I know a lot of times you'll read the articles about x86 versus the graviton processor you're just going to get better performance so if it's possible why not use it yeah like if your your workload needs to be pretty compute heavy like cpu heavy workload mm -hmm. workloads will benefit from that yeah the most yeah. if your workload is memory dependent then you're going to pay either way right yeah not going to um, make much of a difference right yeah Awesome. Uh, I'm looking across the top of the tabs there. I'm just checking that we didn't miss anything since I decided to jump all over the place. Uh, but uh, that is <laughs> that, that is yeah. it, I think. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, enjoy your long weekend. We'll we'll be back next week. Oh, uh, let's do shameless plug time here as we oh, end right. the week. We will be back Tuesday night. I skipped this Tuesday. Um, I was just being lazy and sat on the couch. <laughs> Shame on me. Um, we'll be back next Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we're going to continue to work in, work on our own Gen AI solution using uh, Amazon Q for Business. I kind of got it to work, but something's oh, yeah. not quite right yet. So uh, maybe okay. I'll, I'll pick your brain on it before uh, Tuesday, maybe. Um, sure. So we're back on Tuesday night. Uh, yesterday, we did an intro to Identity and Access Management uh, webinar. Uh, I'm working mm -hmm. on cutting out all the dumb things I said during that and <laughs> getting something that <laughs> is ready to put on YouTube. So that'll be there. And then obviously, we'll be back on uh, Friday for another edition of uh, Talking Cloud. So until then, folks, uh, we'll see you next time. Bye for yeah, now. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.